Welcome to today's video. In this video, we're going to continue to look at and introduce IDA Pro. And uh, specifically, we're going to start looking at the desktop, looking at some of the different windows, features, and components within IDA Pro itself. So to begin, we'll start with a screen, a screen capture. And you're going to notice a little bit of a difference here between this and what you're going to see in the IA Lab. And we're going to go through both. Um, the tools, the functionalities are the same. It's just going to look slightly different. This screen capture is actually from the version of IDA Pro that I'm using, uh, so a little bit more recent. And then again, based off of the version, the version that you choose to use, and we discussed those in the last video, uh, whether you stick with the free version that we have in the IA Lab or you want to check out the demo version, it might vary. Uh, of course, this is completely customizable, so as you start to use the tool, then um, I encourage you to kind of rearrange the, the look, the feel, uh, where all these different windows are laid out, how they're laid out to, to best fit you. All of these can become undocked as well. So if you want to break out of this, uh, the confines generally of this window, you can do that. Now, as far as the layout then, um, what we have and what you're going to have in all versions of IDA is this toolbar area. And that's one of the most customizable areas that you can remove and add any toolbars that you see fit that help you out. Um, and uh, we won't use a lot of those here right off the bat, so just uh, explore those as you find time. The next thing is this overview navigator, and this is pretty helpful, this is pretty important in that it's going to show you essentially uh, the linear address space of the program, of the binary that you're looking at, and what's located in that location, as well as, and probably the most important at this point, is you're going to see this little cursor, and it's kind of hard right now, and I'll point it out again when we look at the, the demo through the lab, um, you're going to see where you're at in that address space. Now, what is the address space used for? If you look below, I've kind of hidden it behind that arrow, but you can see that it's all color coded. And all of this information down here, unexplored, instruction, external symbol, library function, data, that's telling you what IDA has determined is at that address or those addresses. So what you generally want to use that for is just to help ensure that you're, or, or to help keep track of where you're at inside of that binary, inside of that file that you're analyzing. And for the most part, we're going to avoid places like library functions, things like printf, or scanf, or puts, or gets, or any of that code that is, is generally not written by the author themselves, right? When we're inspecting a binary, we're generally looking for the, the custom portion, the custom code of that application, not that standard library stuff. And so you can use that. So if you get really lost in a binary, which, which it does happen, it's very easy to do, where you've just jumped around so much, you're not really sure where you're at, or if you're analyzing something that's even important, just stop, take a look at where you're at in this navigator and ensure that you're at least in the right color-coded area. Um, from there, the big window, this is your disassembly view. And this is where you'll spend the, the majority of your time doing your analysis. Um, we'll have two views, and there's a ton of shortcuts and shortcut keys that we can use in IDA. And I'll, I'll point those out here as, as I use them to help um, you know, show you guys what they are, tell you guys what they are. Uh, when you're looking at this disassembly view, you have two primary modes that view can be in. You have this graph view, which is generally the one that I use, and then you have a straight listing kind of textual view, which just gives you the same data, the same instructions. It just lists it all in, um, you know, in sequential order, linear order. It doesn't have the graphs and the flow. So um, you can hit the space bar in this view to toggle back and forth between those two. And again, completely up to you as to determine which one that you find the easiest to work in. Um, I would encourage you early on to just go back and forth between the two views to see which one you like. But uh, as I said, I generally stay on the graph view at this point. Um, here you have tabs, and tabs will open. These are all the different views that you have open. You can see our disassembly view, IDA view 1. This is what is highlighted or kind of grayed out right now. Ability to look at hex, look at structures. We'll deal with structures later on in the semester, imports, exports. Um, and other views that are available through the file menu of IDA Pro itself. Here's the graph view. Graph view is also very helpful in that it's giving you an overview of the current function that you're looking at, the current you know, series of instructions that you're looking at. And so as we look at programs that have more code, more instructions, this can be helpful to quickly navigate around that file in order to get to a location that we want to look at. Okay, this last one is the output window and we probably won't use that directly a lot uh, as far as generating output here. Uh, you can pay attention to that. You can see if I was busy doing something. You can also look for any sort of errors uh, or just output information, status information, but for the most part we're not going to use that. Um, Ida, you can 
script item or you can extend this functionality. You can do that through IDC, which is the um, IDA development environment, or you can also do it through Python, IDA Python. And, and we'll look at and I'll show you likely an example of IDA Python here towards the end of the term. Okay, so here is just kind of going through all of those pieces in a little bit more detail. Um, toolbar area, the overview navigator. Here you can see just that navigator, and if you look closely, there is a little yellow arrow right there behind my cursor. That's going to show you where you're at. Uh, the tabs, all openly, currently open views, and you can open and close those. So if you're working in this disassembly view and you close that view, then you'll you'll need to open it again, and uh, I'll show you how to do that. Um, disassembly view, graph view, and output window. All right, so we talked about all those as well. Okay, uh, another one that I didn't point out, and so if we go back and look at this interface, this big area right here is your functions window, and the functions window lists functions, functions that IDA has identified inside of the program itself. And what you don't realize, or often don't realize, is that if you look at this view right now, um, you can see the scroll bar here. There is quite a bit more information that is not being displayed. And this screen capture shows that um, that window uh, all the way expanded. And so, uh, again, what this window is listing is every function as Ida has recognized it. And this it can be very helpful in determining where you want to go inside the binary. What locations do you want to go to uh, to maybe inspect and do some analysis? So main, start, just for getting to the right location. Right, That's going to be one of the first challenges and issues that we're going to have to deal with is Ida's going to load up the binary and we might not be exactly in main. We might not be exactly in that spot where we want to start you know, doing our analysis. And um, again, we'll work through some examples here over the next few weeks to get a better for a more comfortable feel about that. Uh, a lot of the custom functions or functions that Ida just cannot identify, they'll be listed as sub underscore and then the address that that's located at. So 401010, that's the virtual address that this function, this subroutine is located at. And Ida just gives it a general name like that. And so you have the ability, because remember, we're working with a database now. We're not working with that original binary, that original executable. It, it's the original on code, but it's in an Ida database. And so we have the ability to go through and rename these. And so if you analyze this sub, sub 401010, and you say, oh, all this does is it prints hello world, then you could rename that to print hello world. And then when you're looking at the functions available in that binary, it makes it a little bit easier to double click and jump there, right? Now, hello world, probably don't care much about that. But let's say that this was the subroutine to dynamically generate an algorithm for a piece of malware, and we wanted to further analyze that. Well, now we could uh, identify that function and jump there because we gave it an appropriate name. You can see there's also some additional information here. So the segment, We'll talk a little bit more about segments here. Uh, the start address, the length, whether it has locals, whether it has arguments, and then some additional fields. And you can read more about those at this supporting hex rays um, article here uh, that I've linked to the bottom. Okay, and uh, and again, we'll as we inspect the functions of the programs, then we'll get more familiar, more comfortable with being able to identify things such as locals and arguments. Okay, um, really important to understand here is that there is no undo. And if I didn't mention in the last video, I certainly want to stress it now. There is no control Z, there is no undo button. So if you rename something, if you modify or alter your database, your IDA Pro database, your IDB, then it's permanently modified. And there's no way to go back unless you remember the state, the value, the condition that was in before you modify that. So be careful. Uh, if you think you're going to change something significant, that's going to have a significant impact on that database, then I would save it before making that change. And maybe even save a backup or an archive so that you, you don't run the risk of actually making you know, an irreversible change. Um, there is a back arrow. We'll take a look at that. You'll use it, but it's only for navigation. It's not for undoing. So again, just be very careful. Be very aware of that. You can create a lot of hotkey and shortcut mappings, and uh, we'll be using all the defaults for the majority of the course. And again, I'll point those out as we use those. Um, and then as you're using IDA, it has a pretty good contextual menu pretty much anytime you right click on something. So if, you're, if you want to see the kind of options that you have available to edit an instruction, to edit data, to do something within IDA, generally if you right click on it, then it'll give you a contextual menu, menu options that are 
that are available contextually based off of what you were doing. Okay, as I mentioned, this is probably a little bit better display of that graph view. So here you can see it's a little bit easier to visualize the flow, the control flow of the program. Um, and that's really what we're, what, what I like this graph view for. And that we can see just by these arrows, we can see that this is a loop, right? This is implying that there is a loop, that this functionality is being executed and looping back around. This is to continue the loop. This branch goes when the loop terminates. Uh, same with this. This, without knowing anything about it, I haven't talked about this yet, uh, you might be able to determine this is an if statement. You know, if true, do this. If not, skip it and do that. And, and that's the kind of stuff. Those are the kind of control structures and the flow of a program that this graph view helps you to understand. Um, if you switch it to the other view, that is more the text view, then all the same instructions are there, but it's not displayed graphically. It's just displayed as a linear set of addresses. And, and that's another very important thing to understand. And, and another topic that we'll really, I'll really talk about a lot throughout the course is that all these instructions are located at an address, an address within the virtual address space of a process, of a program. And all it's doing then, this is just showing us uh, in a much more graphical way so that we can understand that. But really, this address for this instruction here, this is the next address. So this one would follow this one. Would follow this one. Okay, um, functions broken up into blocks, and as you saw already in the previous slide, that is just to help allow for that visualization of control flow from one block to another. Um, the flow uses different color arrows to distinguish from the flow type. So if you go back and go back and look at this, you can see we have a blue, we have green, uh, we have red, and those what those colors are telling you. Uh, they're just there to help you to visually determine or understand the flow of the program a little bit better, a little bit quicker. So um, blocks that terminate with a conditional jump. Conditional jump means that there was there was a test. There was something was evaluated or compared before the jump. Jump greater than, jump less than, jump zero. Um, yes, edge is green. No edge is red. So do we take the jump? Green. If we don't take the jump, red. And that's what we're helping to visualize with those colors. Um, terminate with only one flow. The normal edge would be blue. So if we look at this particular block right here, we can see that no matter what happens inside of this, these instructions, it's going to flow to this next block. So this blue block is telling us that it's going to go from here to here every time, no condition, no test. Here we can see we have test EAX EAX. JZ, jump of zero. So we're either going to do one or the other. Yes is green, no is red. Okay, this is another area, and we're going to practice this throughout the semester, in that you really have to understand what the test and what the conditional jump is doing, because it's not always going to map directly like uh, an if statement that you would write in C or C++ or some other higher level language. Um, it might be different, it might be counterintuitive. This might be here you see, what did we say red was? No, don't, you know, no is the value, but no enters this code, right? It, it enters this block. So if you're thinking about that in the if statement, normally you'd think, well, if it's true, enter this block. And, and so it's a little bit, the logic's a little bit in reverse here. Um, and so gotta be very aware. And that's one of the challenges with reverse engineering is, is paying attention to the instructions that are, that are being executed in the program so that you understand the flow. And again, we'll have plenty of opportunity to practice this throughout the semester. Okay, there's some additional display settings. We'll take a look at those. Um, I generally don't change much in here. There's two things, and I'll point those out right now. I generally turn on line prefixes, and this is where to do that. And you can also enable opcodes. So if you wanna see the opcodes, you can say how many bytes of opcode do you wanna see, Type that in this block right here where you can see the cursor, and then click OK, and I'll show you how to do both of those. All right, last thing we'll discuss here before we get into the demo is just simply IDA navigation. And for the most part, IDA is pretty easy to navigate around in. You can double click on anything that represents an address, and then it'll take you to that location. If it's data, if it's an instruction, if it's calling a function. Um, so it's pretty easy to get there. 
when a program is disassembled. Every location is given a virtual address as well. And so you have uh, a file menu option as well as shortcut keys to jump directly to any address. So if there's a particular address that you want, you can go there directly. So uh, the jump to address is the jihad key. And what that does is that opens this little dialog here that you can see below, and now you can type in an address. Type that address in, click OK, and you'll go directly there. But what you'll probably find to be the, e the easiest to work with and use here, especially as we were initially getting started, is just the double-click navigation. Double-clicking on something and taking you right there. This also, because of that functionality, that behavior, it allows for you to double-click very easily and, and get lost in the binary. So remember, you can use that back arrow and you can back out to where you came from previously or just stop and figure out where you are and try to get back to a location in which you need to be. But as you're navigating, just pay attention to where you're at. And if you somehow find yourself in a library function, if you're now deep into the, the inners of printf, you probably don't need to be there and, and you're ultimately wasting time. Not to say that you wouldn't learn something from it, but for the purposes of the labs and the exercises, you, you probably don't need to be there. So just kind of be aware. And of course, if you ever get somewhere, you get lost, and you're really not sure, you can always send me an email and we can set up a time to Skype and be more than happy to help out. Okay, so that's it for the slides. Take a look at the lab here and Okay, there we go. I'm going to close this because we're just going to go, I'm going to turn around and open it up again. Okay, so where we left off last time we were in the IA lab, we were looking at um, just being able to open IDA and open different databases. And you can see here, uh, right now, we just have IDA on the desktop and we have uh, what what is actually the lab one binary file. So I'm just going to continue to work with that. I'm going to formally introduce it in a separate video. So uh, we will get into more kind of details about this particular binary and, and some things I want to point out here when we get to the lab. Uh, but for now, this, you can also open up the practical malware analysis labs and you can use any executable that you want in there. Be careful, this the, this is, the, there are malware samples, live malware inside of these samples. This machine is connected to the internet. So be careful if you're inspecting these to not execute any. And I think for the most part, well, nope, they didn't do anything. Uh, they didn't change the file extensions. So double clicking that will execute it. Can't tell you for sure what it would do. So just be careful um, if you want to inspect those. So for this though, I'll just go ahead and use the lab one file. So I'm gonna drag and drop it onto the desktop icon and that will go ahead and that'll load up IDA for me. Now, keep in mind, as you're loading a file, it's gonna take a little bit of time because IDA now needs to go through that process that we discussed in the last video in order to identify the instructions, the data, uh, to, to parse those opcodes and then to disassemble it to provide us that assembly listing that we want to look at. So you're just generally looking, um, I generally just watch this, uh, the navigation bar, the overview bar, and once I see kind of no more activity up there, this little arrow you can see is bouncing around, then uh, once I see no more activity there, I know I'm good. I also stay in graph view, and once Ida pops me into graph view, then I know it's ready to go. You can also watch the output window as well as uh, this this uh, down here in the bottom left, you can see now that's idle. So that's also telling me that I'm good to go. Okay, so you can see now we're in graph view. And if you want to hit the space bar, that will take you and toggle you back and forth between graph view and the text view. So um, hit space bar, and now what you're seeing is a sequential listing, a linear listing of those addresses. Um, what are the addresses? Well, these are the values right here where my cursor is currently at. These are the addresses themselves. Uh, 004015FE, 0040108. You can see 08 occupies uh, or is repeated, and that's because there are some comments, uh, some things that. Okay, not sure where that came from. Uh, some things that are, are repeated or comments that are repeated in IDA uh, that re still represent just the one address. So uh, in this case, 1608 is really just this instruction, this move instruction. Now, if we go back to where we originally started, uh, here we have public start, and this is a call to this sub. If I switch over the view, you can see that that's not the instruction, that's right here. And what you gotta pay attention for, just like inside of the graph view, you have 
the representation of the control flow. You have blocks and you have arrows, and you still have that within this view. They're just listed here off to the left. The other thing that you have to look at is that this is compressed. You can see it says it right here, press keypad plus to expand, as well as this little asterisk D diamond looking thing. So if you want, you can right click on it and unhide, and now you'll see that this instruction, 4015FE, call sub 40576. Okay, so that's where that was. So I had just had it hidden for us because likely it just it, it identified that as uh, code that is just part of a normal you know compile you know compilation of a program and, and something not important for us to understand. Um, as we navigate here, you can see. Uh, let's see. Before we do that, let's take a look at options. So if you open up Options General, that will give us some of the options. Those options that we talked about earlier. Uh, as I said, I generally don't change anything in here. I turn on line prefixes, and that will turn on the prefixes here. So I think that's helpful because it just it helps to identify or associate the fact that this instruction is at this address. And this is the next address based off of the size of this instruction, the bytes that this instruction occupies, and so forth and so on. Okay, the other thing you can turn on, and I usually don't turn this on, are the opcodes. So let's say that I want to see 10 bytes worth of opcodes. Now you can see the opcodes, the hex that that instruction is. So push 14 hex is opcode 6A14. Okay, but I generally don't need those on. We certainly don't need those on right now. So that's up to you if you if you find those beneficial at this point. Okay, so I'm going to disable those. Um, graph view, as I said, you can see that we're in a function right now, and this is function start, and that uh, there's it's a bigger function, and so this graph view helps us to kind of easily and quickly navigate around that function. Now, this is not the entry point in the pro. Or this is the entry point into the program, and I just identified that for us. But this isn't where we actually want to start analyzing, and so. For this particular binary, for, for the lab one binary, where you want to go down to is this block right here. There's a call to this sub 401100. And that's where we want to start our analysis. So if you, because this represents an address, a call is going to call that location. A function is just simply a location. And call is going to move that location into EIP. So because that's a location, that's an address, we can double click. And now you can see we've jumped to that location. Okay, back arrow, that takes us back to where we were. Not precisely to where we were, kind of annoying, but uh, we can quickly go back to that. So 401100, and you can see this is the address that we now jump to, 401100. Okay, all this stuff up above here, this is information about arguments and local variables and the stack stuff. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, you can see that the first instruction here is push EBP, move into EBP ESP, sub ESP 48X, right? And, and hopefully you identified or recognized that as the prolog for the function. So we're setting up the base pointer um, and then allocating space on the stack for those locals. And because, and, and how this these instructions use that local stack space, IDA has gone through and identified those local variables for us. And that's what these var50, var4c, var48, var44, etc., that's what they're referring to. Uh, again, we'll get we'll get into more of the details here as we do some stack refresher and how IDA is going to represent the stack information for us. Okay, graph view helps us to move around. This is the only section for lab one. This is the only section of the program that you're going to have to go through and analyze. Okay, so again, I just kind of wanted to point that out while we're here, just to help reiterate. Um, looking at some of these instructions, you can see that, uh, for example, we have a move into EAX, this D word 411050. Uh, this represents data. So when you see this, uh, an instruction like this, what this is saying is move into the register EAX, the data that's located at this address, 411050. It's a D word's worth of data, so it's four bytes of data. Because that represents an address, you can double click on that, and you can see that at that address, this is the data there. We have this hex value, BB40E64E. So what is that being used for? Who knows? Um, but we do know that it's being moved into EAX, and then EAX is being XORed with EVP. So uh, that's actually the stack cookie, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, you'll notice backwards and forwards. So I jump to a location, go backwards, I could also go forwards. 
So using these arrows for navigation, not for undoing and redoing commands that we execute in the program in IDA. Uh, okay, locations. So we've got this call to a sub, 401000. Okay, and some things you can do with that would be to rename. And renaming is going to be very helpful because the renaming is going to allow you or help you to add better context to this program. Ida couldn't identify this as a standard library function, so it's probably something that was written custom by the author of this program. So we can double click on it and we can inspect that function. Once we've done that, we can rename it. So if we go back to that original call, if we hit the N hotkey, or just the N key on your keyboard, that'll pull up this rename address. And so what we can do is let's say I want to rename it do something. Click OK and now that's renamed that function, it's renamed that address. So call do something still doesn't mean a lot but it means probably a little bit more than call sub and some address. Okay, You'll also notice in the functions window it updated that sub. Okay, So once you've figured out what a function does it's very helpful to rename it something that gives you insight or helps to, to get better context as to that purpose of that function. Okay, um, You can rename quite a bit. The local variables here, the stack variables you can rename. You can also, uh, let's see, this D word, you could rename that. Uh, you can rename, of course, functions. Uh, so there's a handful of things that you can rename. And uh, if you're not sure, you can always just hit the N key and try to rename it. Okay. Um, comments. Comments are going to be another big one, especially as we're getting started. And so just like in assembly, a comment in assembly is a semicolon, same thing here in IDA. So if you want to leave a comment, pick any address, any instruction that you want, and hit the semicolon key. And what will pop up then is a dialog or a window that will allow you to leave a comment. So I can say this is a comment. And it doesn't look like anything showed up. So what we can do is we can let's see. Let's close this view and see if that helps us. Hmm. Guess not. Let's just try another line. This is another comment. There we go. Okay, you'll run into issues like that with the interface from time to time. Uh, that could have been an error on my part. I just didn't catch it or realize it. That could be an error with an IDA. Uh, a little hard to say. But generally, when you want to leave a comment, you select the line, put your cursor on the line, hit the semicolon key, and then that dialog should pop up. You should be able to leave a comment, and then it should display right next to that line. Uh, the, this block will expand based off of the size of your comment, as well as grow as you saw with that extra new line that I had in there as well. So um, be aware of that, but as you're trying to go through and figure out what everything's doing here, then it doesn't hurt or it will be required in some of the labs to, to leave a comment. To say, okay, you know, for example, this is, this is not a helpful comment, of course, so I'm going to clear it. But I could put here, uh, maybe I say function prolog, just as a reminder to myself that from these first three instructions are prolog, so I don't really care, other than maybe knowing how much stack space is being allocated. Uh, the, the, contact, the contextual menu is another thing that you'll probably use frequently. And so what you can do, in this case, uh, we have this data here, 48 hex, and we know that that's being subtracted from ESP. Well, maybe we want to look at this in a different format. So if we highlight that data, if we click our cursor on that data and right click, we have a contextual menu. Um, you can see here, in this case, we can convert data. 48 hex is capital H, if we wanted to see what that looked like in ASCII. Uh, we could convert it to binary, octal, or we could also look at that in base 10. And so uh, you can right click and you can get that contextual menu here for um, you know a, a lot of different areas within IDA Pro. So again, as we go through and start working through examples and exercises, you'll see me, when appropriate, open up that contextual menu and, and use a feature or a function out of that. Okay, so uh, that's just, a, again, a real brief introduction and uh, encourage you to you know follow along as we're going through these examples in class. 
Um, don't fret, don't worry if this feels a little overwhelming or daunting at this point because we're going to go through, I'm going to provide a lot of samples and examples that we'll work through through the videos uh, as well as the exercises and then of course the labs themselves. So we'll have plenty of time to work with IDAPRO and to, to build that confidence and some you know a, a much higher level of comfort with the tool itself. Uh, as usual though, if you have any questions, you have any comments, uh, let me know, put them in Slack, send me an email, uh, let me know. If something's not making sense and I'm not covering it or I'm not answering it, just certainly let me know. Otherwise, uh, that's all I have for this video. Uh, the next few videos here, we'll start reviewing some of the some basic assembly instructions and then also looking at the disassembly of those in Ida Pro. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop the video and I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Thanks.